what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. This podcast is sponsored by Jackson Creative, a custom communication agency located in downtown Hickory, North Carolina, specializing in online content creation. To learn more, visit thejacksoncreative.com. Jackson Creative, we tell your story. Foot Candle Films, film news and reviews from two guys who really like movies. This episode is brought to you by the Foot Candle Film Society. For a schedule of upcoming screenings and membership information, visit the Society's website at www.footcandle.org. Hello and welcome to Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.TV. My name is Alan Jackson. I am co-director and co-founder of the Foot Candle Film Society and the annual Foot Candle Film Festival. With me across the Zoom channel here is the other co in that co-director and co-founder, Mr. Chris Fry. Chris, how are you doing? Um, I'm doing good. Um, looking forward to talking to movies, uh, talking about movies with somebody outside of the people that are quarantining in my house. So that's that would be you. So this is uh, this is good. This is exposure with the outside world, which is nice. Yes, I, I was going to say we uh, we have been relatively limited in our uh, discussion time to talk. Normally, you and I we work together in the same kind of environment. So normally, if we have movie news to, to chat about. Uh, we have an easy way of doing that. Uh, just offices right next to each other here in the last month or in a half or so, that's been a little more strained. So it's just these zoom calls we have uh, to record the show. So we have a lot of catching up to do, I guess, in a way, unfortunately to balance that out, we don't have a lot of film releases or new films to discuss. So we've got a little bit of a, 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 a trade off there, less time to talk about these, but fewer films to talk about. We're going to fill that time with like, how we've been making masks or bread recipes, or do we have some, we'll have some movie news, right? <laughs> we'll have a little bit. And okay. then I think we'll jump to the new section about bread making. That'll okay. be kind of a new <laughs> segment we start carrying forward. And then a wide variety of different unique mask designs I think would be great as well. So we are introducing awesome. a few new segments. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, you know what? I think we've got enough to cover film related today in the show. So I think we're going to, we're going to focus on that. And in doing so, this is again, our, our film review discussion show. The main thing we do in our film, our, our podcast episodes every time we get together is we do a review a couple of films, new films. Today, we have two new films to discuss, both of them more or less making their premiere online uh, in the midst of uh, the times we're in right now. They are uh, director and writer Kitty Green's The Assistant, and then we'll also be discussing Extraordinary, the supernatural comedy horror starring Will Forte and several others. Uh, so those will be the two films we'll be reviewing, discussing both films available online for rental or purchase as at the time of this recording. Then we'll move on to some movie news items where we highlight a few upcoming projects. Again, the news is a little scant, but we did find a few interesting nuggets to talk about uh, happening in the film community. And then we'll end the show where Chris and I both share a recommendation of a film that we think is worth checking out. Uh, both films being ones you can find at home online uh, available for you to see. So Chris, we do have enough to talk about to make an episode. So let's go ahead and jump right into it if you're ready. Sounds good. All right. Let's go into our first review. It is a film by writer and director Kitty Green. It's called The Assistant. Welcome. Have a seat. Whatever's going on, you can tell me that's what I'm here for. You're relatively new to the company. I mean, I've been working here for nearly two months. And you're under a lot of stress. Entry-level jobs in this industry are tough, right? Long hours? First one in, last one out. Good night. You're smart. You have to be smart. It's a tough job, but I can see that you've got what it takes. I want those new pages before I get on the plane. He promised the first thing. Where we are? 200K and two points. That's bull. Maybe you can put in a good word for you. No, he'll hire externally. Listen, his schedule has shifted. Does 7 p.m. work? Still at the hotel or? Yes. What, 
This is turkey. I said chicken. <laughs> There's a girl waiting. Oh, her. She's been here before. A few times. What is it? The wife. Say he's in an important meeting. No, say he's in a screening. Where is he? What did you say to him? What did you say? They told me you were smart. I overreacted. It was not my place to question your decision. I will not let you down again. You know you can always come to us, right? Come to us first, okay? The last two checks don't have a name or anything, just the dollar amount. Uh, ignore it. Okay, and will he know what it's for? Yep, he'll know. I wouldn't sit there. Never sit on the couch. <laughs> here and here, initial here, sign there. Do I need a lawyer or something? Do you have a lawyer? So what happened? Where did you go? Uh, I was worried for this girl. <laughs> oh. I mean, they were just like laughing about it. Can you deal with this? Hi. Why me? Who was that? A that. Waste of my time. Your mom and I were excited for you. It's a great opportunity. What can we do? Do about what? Chris, in Kitty Green's The Assistant, we have a searing look at one single day in the life of an assistant to a very powerful executive, uh, an executive in the film-related industry, we, look, we come to find out. Uh, Julia Gardner stars as Jane, this assistant, and throughout the film, we watch her basically following her daily routine. We learn that she's been in this job for about five or six weeks. And over this time, even during the course of this one day, she grows increasingly aware of the insidious abuse that threatens her position and uh, her overall satisfaction and her feeling of comfort within her job. Chris, we have a really interesting film here in that this is a film that really is made up of, as the, 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 the summary just said, it's really a lot of glimpses. Um, it's an interesting film that we have moments that are showing us throughout the span of a full day which for, for Jane is a very long day, seems to start probably six or seven in the morning and goes until uh, darkness outside at nighttime. And we're watching these moments, we're watching these instances that start to build this picture of what type of work environment she's in and the kind of person she's working for. Obviously in the scope of how this relates to more real life situations, We've just been going through the Harvey Weinstein uh, crisis in the past couple of years where all of this information about him has been coming out as far as him role as a film executive and the predatory type of nature he'd taken with actresses and other women in the industry. So Chris, it's a very, very important topic, one that is obviously on the mind of writer and director Kitty Green as she wrote and put together this film. My question to you is, it's a, such an important topic worth discussing. Did the film do enough in exploring this topic or, 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 or did you feel like maybe it didn't go far enough or did it leave you wanting in terms of, uh, 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 of how to best describe and discuss this kind of, uh, this kind of a uh, very, very alarming and disturbing uh, situation in the workplace? Well, I, I think Kitty Green's background, uh, she's made some documentaries and uh, one of the ones specifically, I think I've recommended it on the show. I can't remember if I did or not, but I think I have. Um, was 2017's Casting John Bonet. And it was a documentary, but in and that was, you know, about John Bonet Ramsey, who was kidnapped, killed, and, or, you know, disappeared. And it was about, but she took members of the town where John Bonet and her family live and actually cast them in the documentary to do some recreation scenes. It was this very kind of, I know mean, it was very layered, a very layered documentary, but it had some fiction elements and had some, you know, narrative elements that they threw in there. It was really interesting and fascinating and a way to kind of get at truths in kind of an odd way. Mm -hmm. With the assistant, I feel like you can tell her background in documentary because it's kind of, it takes that framework that you mentioned of a single day and it starts very early in the morning and goes till very late at night and, you know, things aren't rushed. Dialogue is very natural, if maybe kind of minimal, 
but there are breadcrumbs that start really early on mm -hmm. <laughs> about, you know, an earring left on a couch or certain appointments having to be moved around because the the official, the the I guess her boss guy exactly, is yeah. you know in, in, he's indisposed or he's doing you know mm -hmm. it's just and you know wife calls for him and things just you know keep happening. But it's never really pushed in your face. It's just slowly laid out. And I think that gives a sense of something, you know, nobody, you know, me being a male, me not being in one of these positions. Yeah, I have no idea what it's really like. But something about the gradual nature of it and the heaviness of the film, to me, just was pretty accurate. And uh, mm -hmm. definitely didn't leave me wanting more because I felt like by the end, the weight was crushing, you know. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of how I, and then, you know, even from the very first shot, you can tell uh, Kitty Green, you know, she's a established filmmaker, but it's just this car idling mm -hmm. outside where, you know, Jane's going to come from her apartment or townhouse. And they just set it there and you can tell it's dark and it's quiet, but it's just something, something about it is kind of weighty, the lighting and everything. And it just, that weight never lets up. It's yeah. never lets up. No, I, uh, I, I, I appreciated this film quite a bit. I, I'm like you that I, I didn't need any more because after the one day, uh, it was it was pretty, pretty daunting uh, to watch. And again, I mean, and people may be hearing this and thinking that it's just going to be this completely, uh, really, really grueling situation. And it's not. It's just this slow build of everything in a one typical day. That's the thing I think you have to remind yourself at the end of the film. This was one day. Right. One single day where she's been in this job for weeks now and one single day. And we had several of these things and moments come up throughout the day that just paint this much, much more alarming picture of, of what she's dealing with. And I think the film did a great job of showing us that typical day. And I think we're led to believe that yesterday was probably very similar to today. Tomorrow is going to be very similar to yesterday. Um, and that's the that's the scary part is that you realize you're just watching one day. This isn't a one year accumulation of everything that's going on. This is one right. single day in this person's life. Um, the film the film is really a moment a series of glimpses, which I at first found difficult to kind of get find myself getting into, but then really started to ease into that flow after a while, where it's just here's a moment, here's another moment, here's a moment all those individual moments on their own, not really mounting to much, but then you start piecing them together throughout the film and you start realizing, okay, yeah, this is painting a very damning picture of what's, what's going on. Um, especially by the time that another character is introduced, a, another assistant, I guess I should say, all introduced right. into the role. That's when I think you get to the point of realizing just like Jane, Julia Gardner's character in the film does to the point of, okay, this is, <laughs> This is something a little bit more tangible that we have to deal with, um, which leads to probably, to me, the most interesting scene of the film, but also probably the most disturbing film uh, scene in the film, the HR conversation. Oh, um, yeah. Up until this point, Chris, we've had a film. Uh, it's a film of glimpses and moments and quick little asides of what was happening throughout the day. That's the dialogue where she decides to go visit an HR representative is the first and only time in the film I feel like where they really have a story or a plot that they're going to like drop in the middle and it lasts for like five or 10 minutes. And then it goes back to the, the same style it was before. And I think it worked because it just shows us where she got to mentally. And even in that conversation, nothing is ever spelled out. Now that nothing's ever just so plainly said, here's the situation, here's what's going on. It's a lot of it is left to interpretation. A lot of it's left to innuendo, but it's just very, very upsetting scene to see how some valid concerns that are growing with her are treated by someone in a, uh, a more corporate position and almost as an acknowledgement of what's going on without you know, a little bit of a threatening nature to what was, was happening in the situation. So again, you hear about these stories of people who find themselves in a very uh, distressing work environment where there are uh, sexual misconduct, there's harassment, there's other situations and people are encouraged to not report it or not say anything because it could hurt their career, could hurt their trajectory with the company. I think this, this HR dialogue scene, the perfect example of 
I'm sure what is a much more realistic situation for people in that kind of environment. So, yeah, that, that HR scene, you're right. It, it's, it could actually be taken out and made kind of into its own short film <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because, you really. know, the stuff on either side is supporting evidence, but just that little, you know, five, 10 minutes or something is, it's really amazing filmmaking. It's very tight. It's well acted on both parts. And if anything, Unfortunately, I don't know the actor's name, but the guy that plays the HR official, his like where he starts at in the meeting and then where he ends at the end of the meeting, it's like it's amazing. You know, it's just you know, it starts like, oh, hello, typical, you know, appointment with HR. What do you need to talk about? And then, you know, kind of acting, consoling at first. And then just you can see him like cement hardening or setting and being like, you know, this is the stone wall. I hear what you're saying, but you're going nowhere. You need to appreciate where you are. Like just total yeah. that, that, yeah. So it makes that scene really amazing. And I, you know, I could see <laughs> that scene being like a clip of that being taken for the Oscars. If, you know, she were to get nominated or he was getting nominated for best supporting actor, or even just for writing, you know, just showing that scene. It's like, here you go. This is was, this is what filmmaking is. It was such a good scene, and I say that meaning that it's disturbing, upsetting, sure. and something that I don't ever want to have me or anybody I know ever be a part of. But as far as the way it was paced and the way it was scripted, and just uh, Matthew McFadden was the one who played Wilcox, okay. the uh, Wilcox, the uh, HR person. Okay. Even even Kitty Green's decision in that scene to have him be distracted and almost interrupted at times by, you know, phone call and just really amplified this, this nature, this, this position where you almost get the feeling of, yep, he's been here before. Yep. He's gone through this pace before this has happened. He knows what, what this is going to lead to. He knows the questions to pose back to Jane to right get her off her, off her center a little bit. He, it was played perfectly. So that whole scene was a, it was a great masterclass in, in scene with a, where you don't go out and just explain everything that's going on, but right. you don't have to, if the acting and the dialogue is strong enough, you know exactly what's going on. And uh, boy, it was, it was something. So to have that right in the middle of the film, and then you're basically, you're seeing the morning and afternoon scenes and glimpses in the first half. And then you're seeing more of the late after late afternoon, evening glimpses and the aftermath of her going to visit HR, a couple of, phone calls and dialogues happen. Uh, it's just a, it is, is the most subtle type of horror film I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, where it's like, nothing is obvious. Nothing is over the top. Nothing is in your face, but just that building accumulation by the end of the day, you're just drained and you understand yeah. where Jane is. And uh, I, I really admired the film. I thought it was a really, really well-made effort. And uh yeah, may not be a, a more than one timer for me, but um, I think it did what it was what it was needing to do and help uh, help kind of illuminate kind of what what some people uh, I'm sure are facing in their in their lives. And it does feed in a little bit of the narrative we have about when people ask, you know, why if someone is concerned about sexual harassment in the workplace, why wasn't it brought up? Why wasn't it reported? Why wasn't it made a big deal about. And I think this film does is a pretty good counter to that. Say, this is why, you know, this is the situation. This is what is a lot more realistic in a lot of companies. So, you know, very interesting. I think too, the way the film is structured, it's kind of like a detective movie in a way, because mm -hmm. clues are laid out for Jane or yeah. you, the viewer, and you kind of know what's going on, but it just, it kind of, everything kind of locks into place. And then, she tries to solve the case by going to HR and it goes nowhere. So then it's like, okay, the, and the aftermath, like you were talking about pieces start happening. It's like, okay, what is she going to do? What, you know, how is it going to resolve? And it kind of doesn't resolve. <laughs> so yeah. um, telling too, and that was important was instead of just focusing on her, it was really important that they had two. I mean, it did focus on her, but she had two male coworkers that were in similar roles as her and the way they handled their job and they did do things, but the way they basically the way they enjoyed their job, <laughs> um, you could tell there was a very clear difference between being a male and being a well, female sure. in this yeah. job and even how they acted, how they were treated or not treated and how they treated her. It was very obvious. It's like, you know, yeah, we're kind of all on the same position here. 
but you're female, therefore you are not as, you know, important or as big as we yeah. are, you know? So yeah, it was just well, not, and it wasn't rubbed in your face. It was just kind of subtle. And they kind of, you know, air quotes, help her at one point when she's gotten <laughs> in trouble. And you're just like, no, you, well, this is, this is terrible. <laughs> that actually happens twice where they both just kind of, she's got to either write an apologetic email or right. write something in, in both situations. They just kind of, gravitate over to her over her shoulder to say here's what you need to say here's the words you should use and then of course she's the one getting the sandwiches and getting the food for everybody and and just uh, uh having to answer the phone and buzz people yeah it was very very clear at that point the role they saw themselves in versus the role that that they felt like she was meant to play um and and i i think too uh like you mentioned, it would have been interesting going into this film, not knowing the subject matter because yeah, that's true. That's the thing I knew on the bare minimum. It was about a possible sexual harassment or a more uh, uh, harassing work environment. If I didn't know that it would have been truly like that detective film where you're, you're being given these little clues in the first half hour and you're starting to build a case in your head and you're like, Oh, I now know what's going on. Unfortunately, going into this, we, we kind of knew that one line synopsis. So I knew that that's sure. where it was going to be heading. But I think uh, the film would have played really well without any knowledge going in and to see at what point it triggers with an audience that something's really wrong here and uh, how much it takes to build that up. So we, we complimented, uh, you called out his name, Matthew McFadden as the Wilcock, the HR representative. And we've talked about Julia Garner, but I just want to make sure like this is a star oh, turning film. performance for her. Yeah. She's amazing. In it. And there again, it's not as much a lot of flashy dialogue. It's just watching her and she communicates so much just with her body language and her looks and how she holds yeah. her shoulders and what she's hearing. And, you know, it's just, it's really she it's a really good turn for her yeah, she's she's really good she's someone i've seen in, in a couple other uh, things she's been involved with the, the tv show ozark on netflix she is uh one of the leads on that show and then she was also do you remember the uh mini series about the david koresh uh the waco there was hmm. a mini series called waco that uh okay um uh, she was actually one of the uh, larger supporting characters in so she okay. she's extremely talented, and yes, this film I thought she did really a really great job. You're right, not a lot of dialogue, it's a lot of reactions, and it's a lot of just feeling uncomfortable and feeling that level of uncomfortableness that she has. And I think it all comes comes to an end with a phone conversation at the end of the film she has with uh, with a family mem family member. You can yeah. just tell by almost the quivering in her voice, the hesitancy she has to answer questions. Uh, uh, you can tell where she is. And I think she does a great job of that throughout without non-traditional dialogue throughout the yeah. film. Yeah. I, something I thought was interesting too. And, you know, in a bigger budget Hollywood film, there probably would have been a lot more examples of seeing famous people. <laughs> like, you know, you think of something like shortcuts where that film was just, and in, or not shortcuts, but player, the Robert Altman film that's just inundated mm -hmm. with stars and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But there was one cameo, and it's not real flashy. It's just, you know, she's in the elevator with Patrick Wilson, and he doesn't <laughs> identify himself. I don't think he even says anything. No, but you doesn't. see him, you're like, oh, that that's that guy. And you're like, was well, that really him? And it was like, you know, it, it gets to the floor where they're supposed to get out, and there was this awkward, you know, oh, you, you can go first, you know, because you're a lady, and she's kind of, it's like this awkward, who's going to exit the elevator first? And it was kind of brief, a brief moment of levity, but because you can tell by the way she acts, he is somebody famous. He is a male. She is this lowly assistant. And it's this awkwardness. So it's kind of heightened rather than it. I mean, it still was cute because he's obviously not you know, predatory or anything. But still, it's just this like, this is what she's dealing with all mm -hmm. the time. Even something as yeah. simple as getting out of an elevator. You know, it's, sure. and I, I thought that was a really, it was, you know, it was a slight moment of levity, but it was still a telling moment in the story. So I really thought that was a a neat touch that they put on there. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Overall, I think we're both kind of on the same page with this. It's a, it was a really good movie. It was a, yeah. uh, a tough watch is a, it's a very interesting uh, topic to be discussing. But again, I love the fact that it's a much, much to me, much probably more realistic portrayal of what um, a harassing or uh, a, a lack of ethics in the workplace environment could be for someone much, much more realistic about how it's smaller moments throughout the day. And it's, uh, 
uh, being pushed back with an, when any time, anytime any uh, concerns are raised about it. And again, I think this film did a great job of showcasing that for people who may not understand when they hear why people are hesitant to report situations in the workplace. I think this film does a great job of explaining what that situation truly looks like for people that find themselves there. So. Well, I'll, I'll say too, you know, it, this important topic, important film, and a good example of how they approach the subject matter, um, a film from last year we never discussed on the show, I think with maybe the exception, I don't think we discussed it on the show, except that maybe around Oscar time we may have talked about nominations, but Bombshell, did we discuss that at all on the show? Um, we did. We actually did review okay. Bombshell. We did review it. Okay, so yeah. I don't need to go into detail, but like, you know, everybody knew what happened at Fox News and how they came out with Roger Ailes. But the handling of that and the in-your-face nature of that, to me, this film was much more effective instead of kind of, it was a much more effective way of telling that story. Yeah. So, Well, probably a lot more realistic for what a lot of people find themselves in. Because sure. even though this was a film executive office, we're never given any details on exactly, you know, what type of person. Also, I should mention the fact, I thought it was a great choice to never show the, the executive. Right. Like, we never saw him. And you right. can barely hear him. Like a lot, only times we hear him is through a phone call, which the voices on the phone call are relatively muddled and, and faint. You can make out some of the words, but you're really meant to hear more of the tone and, and all than anything. But the choice to never show him, I thought was interesting. But the fact is that we don't know how big a company this is. We have no idea how big uh, this person is. I mean, this person could be a mid-level film executive in the film world. We don't know. We just don't know the scope of it. But I guess the, the fact of the matter is it doesn't matter. You know, right. doesn't matter if it's a one up level supervisor or if it's truly like the biggest film mogul in the world. We don't know where this person falls in the in the scheme of things, but it doesn't really matter. It's the, the behavior is still the same and uh, the impact it's having is the same. So that's great. Great. Well, anything else you wanted to say? I mean, I think Julia Gardner was great. I think the, the filming, the, the cinematography was really good. A lot of still shots, a lot of long takes, but I think it was very effective in the way it built up the tension. Um, and overall, I thought it was a really good film. Yeah, I'm on the same page. It was one of the better uh, independent films I've seen of 2020. Uh, and a kind of a, a dictionary entry for the whole show me, don't tell me as far mm. as what's going on in filmmaking. Perfect yeah. example of that. So. Agreed. Agreed. That is The Assistant, written and directed by Kitty Green. It is available on uh, Apple TV, Amazon, any of the places where you could typically rent online films it's available for you now and both chris and i highly recommend as something if the subject matter you find intriguing and something that you'd like to explore a little further uh and looking for a relatively low-key and slower paced film but one that really has some some emotional um, weight to it i think that's the assistant so now chris let's flip over and talk about a film uh, very very different from the assistant and this is a supernatural horror comedy film starring uh mr will forte as well as Maeve higgins and barry ward it is called extraordinary why don't we see ghosts every day oh leave me alone most hauntings are so small they go unnoticed hi this is rose's driving school Maybe you could have a chat with my daughter just to find out what's up with her. My name is Martin. Oh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Martin, she's floating. She's floating, Martin. I know. What is evil? <laughs> hey, dinner! Coming, my sweet. I'm doing an incantation. Bloody moon better make me bloody rich. Yes. This is a satanic ritual. Satanists. I woke up in the morning. To break the spell, Baby. we need ectoplasm. You just have to let the ghost inhabit your body. Like in Ghostbusters. Oh, I haven't read that. Just the plot thickens. Why does it have to be so unnecessarily gross? That magic. Aha. Uh -huh. Your girl's got something. Prick. Holy s***! magic! This is over. Ring! Hello, little ghost lady! No. Oh! I'm sorry! I thought you were dead!
Extraordinary tells the story of Rose, a driving instructor living in rural Ireland who is gifted with supernatural abilities. Her love-hate relationship with this talent comes into focus as she is hired to help her father prevent his daughter from being sacrificed to the devil by a washed-up rock star, played by Will Forte, who schemes this will be the way he finally gets his career back on track. Comedies from across the pond have varying degrees of success in the States because humor, you know, kind of often fails to translate. Alan, did enough jokes translate for you in Extraordinary to make it a success? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I had okay. a fun time with this film, so I thought it was really <laughs> funny. Um, it's it's great when a lower, lower, I, I hate saying low rent, low budget, whatever, is a, is a lower tier film that doesn't feel the need to put just so much money into special effects or uh, over the top production, just letting the characters have fun and throw in some really bizarre situations, but while also, also adding in some interesting story elements and some uh, nice little moments of drama and personal connection as well. So overall, yeah, no, I had, I had, I thought this movie was a lot of fun. This is one I kind of went in with no expectations and found myself really surprised by um, there's a lot of moments I can pull out that I thought were really well done and a lot of nice touches and positive elements to it. Overall, the main key is I just, I had a good time with the film, uh, at the, at the end of the film, I was able to look, you know, my wife and I watched it together and I said, you know what, that was, that was fun. I had a good time with that. That was a, an enjoyable film. Um, surprising in moments, both in its kind of <laughs> shocking use of violence and also kind of very shocking situations at times too like we can get into a little bit more but i thought it was all played extremely well and uh i had a lot of fun with it so chris i'm curious your, your thoughts on this yeah so um there are so many jokes in this film and you do you hear the premise you know it sounds like it's this kind of outsized outlandish premise and you think okay yeah that's going to be funny for maybe like the first 15 or 20 minutes but then it's going to kind of get old and it's not really going to go anywhere and it's just going to be, you know, boring and dumb after that time. For me, that was not the case. There were so many jokes and most of them landed. <laughs> and, you know, I, I find that I could just sit here and list them all and pull like a Chris Farley. Like, hey, do you remember that? Yeah, that was really funny. Like, you know, Chris Farley, Saturday Night Live bit. Yeah. But I really did have a great time with this film. And I I think, you know, seeing the trailer, I was afraid, you know, there were some funny moments in there. And I was like, well, that's the other danger is now this film is not going to be anything much more than those scant funny moments and then you know the runtime's not going to hold for me but that wasn't the case there was so much here that i liked and you know you mentioned both of us have thrown out will forte that's because most people know him because of saturday night live he's not i mean he is great in this film but he's not the main focus you know no no Hmm. and uh you mentioned barry ward as martin martin the you know the father (laughs) And then Maeve Higgins as Rose Dooley, who's like the woman who has the, you know, supernatural powers or whatever. Those two are great and have oh, great so chemistry together. And yeah. I have, I've never really, I don't think I've seen either one of them before. Mm-mm. So for yep. two unknown people to be the main centers of this movie and hold their own and, you know, hold their own against Will Forte, who was excellent. Yeah. yeah that just shows you kind of, this is one of those comedies for me that definitely translated. I, I I really like Will Forte as a comedian. I think he's great. I like most of the stuff I see him do. And I, yeah, I went into this expecting that I was just going to look for his parts in the film and he was going to be the scene, uh, scene stealer in every, every moment. And I did enjoy his moments, but you're right. When it cut to, uh, you know, Maeve and Barry um, playing Rose and Martin, I, I enjoyed them just as much, if not even a little more at times. I thought they were just so, so great. Um, Maeve Higgins is Rose Dooley in particular. I, she's got some great comic timing. Yes. She plays the sweet, but also uncomfortable with herself. And yet, you know, uh, just so much was, so much was right with her character and it really just worked really well. Um, and plus we've got some, some creative use of old VHS footage and, yes. and moments throughout the film, which I thought was a nice touch and kind of both bookended the film and then was kind of brought up at one point as a, as a plot a plot point as well. So uh, yeah, no, it was good. I'm like you, I've just got a lot of moments of like, yeah, this part was great. And this is my favorite part. And Oh, I like this line. So a lot of that. And I, I can't really find a lot to disagree with on the film. 
the runtime was good and tight. It was an hour 30. Didn't feel like it really wasted any time. It really moved the story along. Um, and even though, <laughs> even though I could argue on a slight little bit, um, when they started kind of introducing this, this plot element where, okay, so basically we Rose and, and Martin have kind of now gotten together to team up. Uh, Martin's daughter has been abducted and she is now the uh, intended uh, person for a, a, a demonic sacrifice that Will Ferrell's, mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, Will For Forte's character is planning on doing. And as they're trying to figure out how they're supposed to stop Will Forte's character from performing this ritual, uh, they had to go around it. And it's kind of this contrived thing of where they've got to go and meet up with all these other ghosts to try to extract ectoplasm from these ghosts. Right. And <laughs> you hear that and you think, okay, so that's just a way of moving the story along. We got to go reach all these six or seven ghosts or whatever. But the fact that they're actually collecting the ectoplasm in a jar, a, a candle jar that's actually branded McGuffins. Right. <laughs> I absolutely love. <laughs> so it's well, basically, yeah, we know we're having to just try to come up with a plot point to get us down this path and have some really fun encounters with some different ghosts, but we get it and we're going to have fun with it. And it's still going to be entertaining all the way around. So it was well, great. And, they, and they, that's, that's an example of a joke with the, you know, the MacGuffin thing that you could pick up on or you could totally gloss over Yeah, and it doesn't hurt your enjoyment of the film. Cause there's so many other jokes like that. You know, they make yeah. reference to the exorcist and ghostbusters and, you know, May passes those off as like, oh, I haven't read that. Like, like she doesn't realize <laughs> those are movies that Martin is. But I mean, the mere character name of Martin, his name is yeah. Martin Martin. That's his yeah. name. And it's right. like, you know, just the deadpan delivery of that. Like, you're such a boring, white bread <laughs> guy, average Joe, that your name is Martin Martin. Your parents yeah. couldn't come up with anything more imaginative to give you as a first name. Like, there's so many things like that that just, yeah, this... This is one of my favorite comedies in a long time. And if, yeah. for it to be so under the radar, I think oh, that yeah. helps because that yeah. way you go in, like you said, with, you know, yeah, the trailer looked funny, but we'll see. And then you come out like, wow, no, that was really pretty solid. <laughs> yeah, it really was. And, uh, oh, there's so many moments in this film that I could just, yeah. Well, and plus I love the fact that it, it would, it would play with a lot of these norms too. So Martin, Martin, his wife, you you find out as soon as you meet him, has deceased. She's she's, but she's still haunting him. Yes. And of course, you would expect it to be where he's, uh, you know, his wife is someone that's trying to look out for him and trying to help him <laughs> and all that. And it kind of gets twisted on its head when you start to learn more about his ex-wife, and right. you actually kind of meet her in a way, um, which is amazing. A, <laughs> it really is. Yeah. The use of the cigarette, um, yes, <laughs> as a transition between Martin, between he and his his ex-wife is just so good, and uh, yeah. that's great. There's a there's a quote car chase scene that mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> at a snail's pace, uh, following a floating the daughter floating, uh, uh, being brought into, uh, Will Forte's character's, uh, castle. It was just, just so funny. Just the way they all went about, um, you've got great supporting actors too. I mean, even though yeah. we mentioned the three lead actors, yeah. uh, the, the person who's playing Will Forte's character's wife, Claudia Doherty as Claudia Winter, I thought was really good too. She was a lot of fun. And, uh, so yeah, it was just, this was just a really funny movie. <laughs> so yeah. It was so good. Well, and I think so you you mentioned how you know there you know there's only one big name actor that we're familiar with. The effects, yeah, they're not really slick. There were white sheets with holes poked in them used to denote ghosts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, paranormal effects of just a branch waving or or pebbles yeah. moving down a driveway <laughs> right. or something like that. Well, which again, they kind of allude to the fact that. Most people expect ghosts to be like doing this major production. Really, a lot of it's just just trying to get your attention with one <laughs> little motion. <laughs> right. And so and that, you know, trying just to get somebody's attention. That's also kind of a nod towards Maeve herself. You know, she's just this simple person yeah. who's lonely, mm -hmm. who just wants attention, just wants to date somebody, just wants to meet somebody. And yeah, it's just so many things that the movie's great. And I will say the last shot of the movie. Yeah. Oh. I love the way it subverts expectation. I won't give anything away. Not that I'd be giving away, but just the last like shot. It's so, and the well, cut again, to black is so amazing. <laughs> they're so happy to play against expectations throughout the film. So, you know, a, a supporting character just gets 
killed very kind of surprisingly that you don't expect, you know, at one point in the film that, um, you know, it was bloody, but very funny uh, the way it happened. The ending shot, the dialogue between, you know, two main characters, yeah. you're right. Just perfect. Uh, exactly played against what you would expect it to be. Martin's ex-wife uh, as the ghost, completely different than what you would expect based on the first half of the film. Yeah. So many things where they're just, they're just, they're willing to play with the expectations and just have fun with it. And it was just, it was great. So it was so good. Um, I'll say that kind of a summary of how I feel about it and what if people think they might be interested. It's imagine if Taika Waititi had made scary movie, this would be the result. And um, I look forward to, we haven't really mentioned uh, the writer director duo, Mike Ahern and Enda Lohman. I think I said, I'm mm-hmm. saying their names correctly. Um, I can't wait to see what they do next because Same here. as well written as this film was with all the jokes and how the direction was pretty crisp and efficient. I can't wait to see what they do next. So, yeah. Oh, and even though you mentioned the the production, which yes, was relatively low rent production work and uh, sheets over, over people as a ghost. I actually kind of liked the design oh. of the final big bad character. I thought it was pretty, <laughs> pretty creative and creepy. And, and it was, was really good, and so, yeah. but it wasn't like over the top or anything. Oh, it yeah, was yeah. still kind of had this do it yourself aesthetic. And that, that lent towards the charm of the movie. If a movie that yeah. has horror elements could be charming, this, this would be it. You know? yeah. So yeah, I think that was actually a bonus that they didn't, you know, try to make things too slick. So, so it looks like this, this writer director duo, um, They've only made some short films before. This is their first actual work on a feature film. So I agree with you. I'm excited to see what they can do next. They've got definitely got some great comic talent, uh, both in writing and just even in the pacing of the film to make this such an enjoyable watch. So uh, I will just say in summary, I love this film. I thought it was super funny, had a great time with it. Very creative and inventive. Um, I will say for people who are kind of going into this blind, Okay, it's a little on the on the bloody, gory side. It's a little more on the violent side than maybe you would think a, a light comedy might be. Uh, but uh, despite all that, I, I thought it was great. I had such a good time with this film. So I'm so glad we I'm so glad we watched made ourselves watch it to review it because it's oh, uh, yeah. it was definitely well well worth it. So that's great. That is extraordinary. Again, out on rental, Apple, Amazon, any of the typical rental services, you can now. Rent a copy of this film to watch in your own time. And just like The Assistant, these are two films that Chris and I sound like we were both very high and positive on. Uh, two very different films might make for an interesting double feature. I don't know if I necessarily recommend that as a double feature, but I think uh, definitely however you choose to watch them, we both uh, want to give strong recommendations to both films. So, so Chris, we're going to take a quick little break. and When we come back, we will do some movie news items, and then we'll also jump into our recommendations of the episode. So this is Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.TV. We will be right back. Hey, this is Moose from Street Circle Drive. That's the Hickory, North Carolina-centric podcast here on The Mesh. Be sure to check out our show and all the others at TheMesh.TV. Welcome back to Foot Candle Films here on the TheMesh.TV. This is Alan Jackson and Chris Fry, both with the Foot Candle Film Society and Foot Candle Film Festival. And uh, we had our reviews in the first half of the show of The Assistant and Extraordinary, both films getting very, very strong recommendations from both Chris and myself. So a nice double feature of films. It's always good, Chris, to have a show where we're both really excited and happy about two films that we reviewed. Doesn't always happen, but this is, a, this is a case where we are both on the same page and it's nice to have two really great films to be uh, discussing. So... So let's move into some news items, Chris. And this is, a, you know, in our typical show, when we were in our studio on a more regular basis, we'd have little segments and things we do in our news segment. We're really just talking some general news items here, because honestly, there's just a, not a lot going on in the film community as far as outward communications about things happening with new film projects. A lot of film projects are still in a little bit of limbo, waiting to see when they'll pick back up production, when they're going to be allowed to have production again. So everything's kind of in a pause. So the amount of news coming out is pretty scant. But uh, I did scour the internet, Chris, to find (laughs) at least three items that I think were worth us discussing. Uh, So let me jump right into them. Sure. First one. This is a new film that will be coming out. It was just announced this week. This film will be premiering on Netflix 
on June 12th. Okay. This is another situation where uh, I kind of equated a little bit to where when Martin Scorsese, it was, the announcement was made that the Irishman was going to go straight to Netflix. It's a little surprising. It's not exactly the act, the uh, director and medium combo I would have expected for delivering mm-hmm. the latest film from a highly acclaimed act, uh, director. But we have another situation with it now. Spike Lee, his new film, The Five Bloods, uh, starring Chadwick Boseman, it was announced that it is going to get released uh, globally on Netflix on Friday, June 12th. So this is yet another one of those auteur filmmakers that I wouldn't have expected to go easily into the online distribution format for their film. Spike, sure. just like Martin Scorsese and others, seems to be someone very intent on the theatrical experience and getting people to the theaters. But I guess in times like these, when you've got a film that has been done for almost a year, and you're trying to find distribution for it, Netflix comes a calling. And uh, sounds like from the articles I read in various places that Netflix had been kind of aggressively pursuing Spike Lee to try to see if they could be the carrier of his next film based on the success and critical acclaim of Black Klansman, his last film. So, sure. uh, so yeah, so that is Duff Five Bloods is the film. Friday, June 12th will be on Netflix. And let me... Chris, I'll just tell you a quick synopsis of the film, and then you can let me know any thoughts you've got on it. So okay. this film follows four black war vets who returned to Vietnam in order to search for the remains of their falling squad leader. Hmm. So it's a wartime film, but yet it's like after Vietnam. So for uh, the, the four veterans coming back to try to find those remains of their squad leader. Um, and plus the promise of, quote, buried treasure. A little hmm. interesting there. Also stars Jean Reno, Delroy Lindo, uh, Jonathan Majors, and Paul Walter Hauser. And then Lee oh, wrote wow. the script. Yeah, yeah. So Paul kind Walter of decent Hauser, stat, that's the guy that was... Involved. Yeah. Um, so Paul Walter Hauser, I don't know if we talked about... Mm-hmm. See, there, I blank... 2019, because we <laughs> 2020 has been so eventful that 2019 yeah. seems like it was six years ago. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> The film, the film uh, Richard Jewell uh, came out oh, and right. kind of came and went. It was Clint Eastwood's film. But Paul Walter Hauser was in that ah, film. okay. And um, I thought he was really strong. He plays Richard Jewell. And so I was kind of curious. Like, I wonder what he's going to do after. And so he's going to be in a Spike Lee film. That is, yeah. that is interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested to see that. And yeah, it, it is kind of surprising that uh, Spike Lee – is going to release something on Netflix. But, you know, if Martin Scorsese did it, I guess that's that's paving the way right there because it's like, okay, here's a well-esteemed filmmaker mm-hmm. and he chose to do this. So, yeah. Well, it, just, it always is a question for me. Okay, back when Scorsese released The Irishman, I mean, there was no, that was not a COVID-19 virus-related right. situation at all. That was purely a, look, I made a three-hour film that uh, I could either go to theaters or Netflix is giving me a really great opportunity to, to stream it on their service. So here I'm curious with, with the five bloods, if it is purely driven by Netflix is making an incredible offer and this is, seems to be the best way to deliver it. Or if it's a, we don't know the status of movie theaters. We've been sitting on this movie for a while. So let's just go ahead and right. get it out there. Uh, and this seems to be the best way to do it. I don't know. I don't know what factors really led to the decision on this. But I will take it as a, as a, as a, as a viewer, as a good thing. This means that in about a month time from today, I'll be able to watch the latest Spike Lee film, which may or may not be showing at the movie play a multiplex by that time. So that's a sure. overall, I'll take it as a good thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm lucky that I'm already a Netflix subscriber, so I get to see it, you know, kind of for free. So, yeah. so that's nice. Um, I'll mention with Spike Lee, um, you know, it, I saw that this movie was coming out, but I didn't see any of the details. Definitely didn't see that Netflix was taking it um, because one of the things that I did see that Spike Lee just put on Instagram, I think Mm -hmm. last week or so, um, he just put together this little clip montage of scenes from around New York. And uh, you can go, if you're on Instagram, just look up Spike Lee and you can watch it. And it's to the tune of New York, New York, Frank Sinatra singing New York, New York. And it is so good. Kind of, kind of, maybe the uh, waterworks start up towards the end of it. Because, you yeah. know, you start off and you're like, okay, I've heard this song and everything. But just some of the images and stuff that he puts in there. And, you mm-hmm. know, from and Spike Lee doing it too, 
it's not, you know, heavy handed pushing an agenda. It's just like, yeah, guys, let's, you know, kind of stick together in this. And he's not in it. It's all just footage. Yeah. And it's just really well done. So that's something people could also, it's not we're getting into recommendations, but uh, yeah. you could seek that out on Instagram if you are curious. Well, I know both of us were were positive on Black Klansman. We liked that film quite a bit. And I felt like it was a good return to form for Spike Lee, where I felt like he'd been a little, his films have been a little sporadic in quality wise uh, for a while, but that Black Klansman, I think, really brought home and was to me a quintessential Spike Lee film that I was hoping to see. So I'd be curious to see if he continues that with Five Bloods or not. And, uh, and of course, Chadwick Boseman in the starring role. You know, I know he's been in some other things outside of Black Panther and the Avengers movies, but I really couldn't tell you much about any of those other roles. So I'm excited to see him in a another high profile role, especially working with Spike Lee to see what he, what he can bring to the table. And if it's more than what we've seen in just the typical action movies uh, he's been a part of. So. Absolutely. Great. So let's move on to another news item, Chris. And this one uh, kind of alludes to, you mentioned this, this director's name earlier. And during one of our reviews, I think in the review for extraordinary, you mentioned this, this person, Taika Waititi. He of uh, what we do in the shadows hunt for the wilder people. And then of course, Thor Ragnarok, the third Thor movie he uh, directed. Um, He's been kind of mixed around. And then of course, Jojo rabbit, we talked about um, from this Mm -hmm. past year as well. So a lot of films. He's slated to do, was it love and thunder? He's doing the the fourth Thor movie called love and thunder, which uh, yes, with uh, Chris Hemsworth. And I think Natalie Portman returning for that as well. That one, according to all the pre-buzz, is getting to be super hyped as a very off-the-wall movie once again. Kind of continuing, as you would expect. <laughs> kind of continuing the whole, uh, uh, what he did with Thor Ragnarok. So, um, Star Wars. Let's talk Star Wars with this in conjunction to this story. You know, Star Wars is in a weird spot right now, Chris. Um, they've got some good success with the Mandalorian on Disney plus they finished season one. And most people walked away from that having enjoyed that series and feeling like it was maybe a little bit more of the traditional star Wars that people were looking for. But then we also had rise of the Skywalker come out in in December, which was not well received by a lot of people kind of considered a low entry in the, in the series. And unfortunately I think a lot of people waning interest in star Wars compared to previous years, but there has been a lot of discussion about people, taking on roles within the star Wars universe as directors. Taika Waititi will be directing and co-writing a new star Wars feature film for theatrical release. So that is crazy. (laughs) Not an episode of the Mandalorian, not which he did direct. He did direct. He did direct an episode of the Mandalorian, but not, you know, anything going on with that necessarily. Sure. This is truly a star Wars feature film with it, which at this point, Chris, the Star Wars feature film universe is completely wide open. We know nothing about any feature films, Star Wars wise. There were uh, all the talks and supposedly deals with two of the great Game of Thrones um, head showrunners that were going to be directing a Star Wars trilogy that supposedly got shelved. We've heard nothing about Ryan Johnson's future involvement with Star Wars. Even yeah, that, he that's kind of gone away. He was rumored to have been involved with a uh, his own trilogy that he was going to be starting up. That's gone away. There was uh, talks of a Ben uh, Ben Kenobi Obi Wan Kenobi solo movie that was going to involve uh, um, the actor. What's his name? Oh, uh, <laughs> What's his name? You Ewan know, McGregor. Ewan, Ewan McGregor. McGregor. Ewan McGregor yeah. was going to involve Ewan McGregor. That seems to go nowhere. There was going to be a Boba Fett solo movie that kind of got replaced by the Mandalorian. Mandalorian. So anyway, really, there's nothing on the Star Wars horizon that I can tell outside of another series of the Mandalorian. So to come out and say that, yes, we're going to do, we're going to do uh, Taika Waititi. He's going to have his own true Star Wars film. Now they're not saying if it's a spinoff film, they're not saying if it's a standalone film, kind of like Rogue One was or Solo was, they're not saying anything details. They're just saying, yes, he will be directing it. And then alongside him, Emmy nominated uh, Leslie Headland uh, is Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. Nope. Christy Wilkin Keynes, who wrote 1917 and Last Night in Solo, Soho, which is the new one coming up from uh, uh, Edgar Wright. Edgar Wright that we talked about in a previous episode. So he, she will be joining Taika Waititi on the screenplay. So you've at least got some really good heavy talent 
writing this thing, Taika Waititi directing it. I'm curious, but again, I don't want to get my hopes up because it seems like every time some of these interesting projects, Star Wars wise comes up, they kind of get dashed a few months later. Yeah. And I, I, I can't help but think since I'm assuming, you know, if all the mojo falls back into place, once, you know, people are able to start filming and everything like that, um, you know, you've had Ragnarok and people were, people liked it, but some people were like, Oh, it's too silly, you know, and then you're going to have the sequel that I imagine will be of, along the same lines. So I wonder if by the time he gets to do a star Wars movie, if people will kind of be like, you know, I don't really want the the silliness. I just want the straightforward star Wars movie. You know, <laughs> like I, I, I wonder how that'll all mesh together. I look forward to seeing it. I think it will definitely be different. But, uh, you know, Brian Johnson came in and did something different with The Last Jedi and made a lot of people mad. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I liked it, but a lot of people didn't. I did too. Um, so, you know, I, I'll be curious to see how he meshes because when he directed The Mandalorian, I think there was, was it the season finale that he directed? I know he directed the scene and I can't remember what, where it fell in The Mandalorian, but it was these two stormtroopers having this like, back and forth conversation like about it might have been the finale yeah okay about what to do with um the baby yoda (laughs) yeah right and they were like they were talking about and it was a very taika waititi like moment i liked it but you know you consider that within the mandalorian which is like a half hour type thing as opposed to having that tone and everything stretched over a star wars movie not sure how it would fit but um yeah i definitely i definitely look forward to it without a doubt yeah, I think it'll be interesting. Again, I, yeah, Taika Waititi did direct the last chapter eight of this, the, the Mandalorian, the last episode okay. there. Um, I think it'll be interesting. Again, I'm just trying not to get my hopes up. I mean, I just feel like sure. all these really interesting projects, it all depends on how the box office fares for the other property uh, uh, shows in the property. So in other words, if Rise of Skywalker had been a huge critical success and really just set box office records for being the last one of the series, I think we'd be seeing a lot more of these projects fast tracked right now. I think the fact that it did not do well solo, the last standalone star Wars movie that was released did not do well creative uh, commercially or critically for most part. Um, they just got, they've got been thrown some bad, some bad deals and uh, they're now trying to figure out where they need to be on the star Wars front. You know, it's kind of funny how there was so much positive talk around when Disney took over star Wars many years right. ago. And when The Force Awakens was released, everybody kind of felt like, hey, look, Star Wars is back. It's stronger. It's going to have mm-hmm. some great stuff. After, I think, Last Jedi, so many of these projects just kind of floundered or did not do as well and lost a lot of uh, uh, viewers. So I think they're just in a tough spot trying to figure out what they're going to do right now. So it's very, very interesting. You know, I, not to dwell because we have definitely spent our mileage and all of our chips have been cashed in on Star Wars and specifically the Rise of Skywalker. Mm-hmm. Um, but during during my home quarantine, I did finally watch uh, Rise of Skywalker for only a second time. I'd only seen it once yeah. when you and I reviewed it. I watched it a second time because I wanted to give it another shot. Um, and it still didn't work for me. And, you know, that I, I was trying to say, I think when we reviewed it, was I blaming J.J. Abrams? Was I blaming the script? You know, the actors, no, these people can all act. It's not yeah. that. And now that I've, you know, taken a look back at it, I don't think I can blame J.J. Abrams because he made The Force Awakens. And that's great. You know, I liked it. Yeah, there were some things that I had problems with, but it's good. So you're like, okay, I think it just all comes down to, I think, I think it's like the Disney Corporation and too many hands in the pot after The Last Jedi and they were so afraid that they were going to lose all of the, basically the fans of Star Wars yeah. ruined the rise of Skywalker. Well, that's <laughs> kind of my feel like it. I, you know, JJ Abrams is a good filmmaker and a good he writer is. and he, he he's is. done good things before. And um, I think there are some moments in rise of Skywalker that work, but they're fleeting moments. I think as a whole, yes. the pictures. And again, I think it's anytime it tries to dip too much in the fan service, that just doesn't make sense in a lot of those cases. That's where I feel like the studio was just getting overly involved. And uh, well, I think they were so afraid to upset fans. They right. created something that was about as generic as you could make it for your fans. And therefore it just wasn't really that great. It wasn't fun. And I think too, and this is obviously no one's fault. And at the time, I think I remember praising saying, I think they handled it as good as they could. 
But from all reports and everything, I think Carrie Fisher and Princess Leia, her character in the final movie was maybe supposed to be a little bit more yeah. integral. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, you know, she passed away, unfortunately. And I think looking at the movie a second time, I, I kind of realized, you know what? I bet if they could have, if she would have been around to, you know, lend her talents, I think it could have helped the movie gel a little more. And they wouldn't mm-hmm. have had to try to, cut and paste quite so much, yeah. even though watching it the first time I said, you know, you were kind of wondering how they were going to handle that because she wasn't dead at the last film. How are they going to have her pass away? It was handled really well, sure. but think it what could have been mm. had she been able to actually do it. And I yeah. think that would have, I think that would have helped a lot. So well, we, it's, it's sad, but if, if anybody listening wants to hear some of more of our thoughts about star Wars in general, you can probably about every third episode for the last <laughs> couple of years, there's some form of discussion about star Wars. So feel free to listen back in any of those episodes you wish to, to continue that discussion, Chris, but all this has just been prelude to the news uh-huh. item. I definitely want to share with you now, and I am breaking the rules uh-huh. a little bit because this isn't star technically a film related update but yet oh, i think we can okay. all uh, we can all find the connections here to make it worthwhile discussing okay imagine television studios and cbs television studios are joining forces for an eight episode scripted series based on a certain article that was published in texas monthly by leaf registrad that was titled joe exotic a dark journey into the world of a man gone wild. So yes, this is the article that prompted the Netflix documentary series that was all the rage at the beginning of this pandemic uh, self self uh, self isolation period that many people went through. So of course you had a a shared experience online of people watching the show. Well, of course the immediate talk started up about are they going to make this into a movie? Are they going to do anything? And who's going to play Joe Exotic? Well, so a I think a little bit bad news is it's going to be a, a eight episode scripted series instead of it being a which, film. It's a little disappointing. Which right away. Me. Yeah, me too. Right away. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I think like most of America now we're kind of done with Joe exotic. You know, yeah. I did watch it. Um, but yeah, the last thing I want to see is a series based yeah. on what I've already seen this year. Yeah. I so. think you could have made a really interesting film out of this on its own. Film, Absolutely. But, um, <laughs> The person now attached to play Mr. Exotic, whose real name is Joe Schrevogel, is Mr. Nicolas Cage. That is interesting. So (laughs) I want to hear your thoughts on this. The only reason I bring this up as a film news is because, I mean, it is Nicolas Cage and Nicolas Cage is a film actor. I don't think he's ever done television before from what I can remember. I can't think of anything in his filmography that would be TV related. So. Having Mr. Cage, very unique, interesting actor with uh, who's made some interesting choices in his own filmography in the past, playing oh, yeah. uh, Joe Exotic. How do you feel about this, Chris Fry? Well, you know, as far as trying to pick somebody to capture the craziness of Mr. Joe Exotic, I think Nicolas Cage will have no problem. It will definitely be an interesting performance. Yeah. <laughs> um, will that alone, you know, I probably will because of that alone, because of that casting. Yeah. I might watch the first episode <laughs> yeah. just out of, you know, curiosity because, you know, I've seen some of his recent stuff, some films he's made Mandy, which was kind of a horror film that came out, I think two or three years ago, the color of space, which just came out recently. And, you know, Nicolas Cage chooses interesting things to do. Mm -hmm. Um, Neither one of those were like some of my favorite films, but he did that film, Joe, that you and I saw a couple of years ago. That was um, good. That was a David Gordon Green film that he was in. So, you know, he he picks interesting stuff. The fact that he picked this and it's a series, which is interesting that he decided to do that instead of a movie. But I guess, you know, it's one of those things. He saw the Joe Exotic character and it was kind of like when, Anthony Hopkins was approached to do Hannibal Lecter. He's like, well, I, I can't not do this you know, yeah, <laughs> because it's I, like, uh, yeah, I see that character. And it's like, no, that's going to be a really good character to play. So yeah. yeah, that is kind of odd, but you know, I will we'll watch see. it just for the Nicholas Cage-ness of it all. And I'm just, I really want to see how they play this guy. That's, that's my now, bigger question. So it's going to be a, 
a limited series that's going to come out on CBS, you said? It doesn't say exactly where it's going to be broadcast. It's just the CBS television studios is producing it. But that could mean it could go. I mean, some CBS property goes to Netflix or goes to other places. Uh, I hope it's not a uh, CBS all access. You have to be a member and watching type of thing. And it's very possible it could be. I don't know. Sure. Um, they haven't announced where it's going to be distri- shown. It's just who the production companies are behind it. So okay. I think it's interesting. Again, I'm kind of done with Joe Exotic as well. I, I, I'm i not one who found the, the, the docuseries to be terribly well done and had a lot of issues with it by the end of the series. Um, but I'm still very curious to see what a Mr. Nicholas Cage will do with this, uh, with this role <laughs> could be yeah. almost the role of a lifetime in a way. So I'm anxious yeah. to see what he does with it. So it'll be talked about one way or the other Absolutely. for sure. So those are our new items, news items. So Spike Lee's latest film to five bloods going straight to Netflix on June 12th. Taika Waititi has been tapped to direct and co-write a new star Wars feature film. And Nicholas Cage will be playing Joe exotic in a CBS television show limited series show here in the near future. So Chris, uh, great news, great reviews, but we have to end our show like we always do where you and I both give a recommendation of a movie that we feel like is worth checking out. And uh, this needs to be a film that can be watched online. So if you're listening to this and you want to follow up on our recommendation, the goal is a film that, you know, within a few minutes of poking and clicking online, you should be able to get access to and watch at your own leisure. So Chris, how about you go ahead and jump in and tell us what your recommendation for the episode is? Sure. And mine will actually have a slight bit of a a news item to uh, pair along with it. Okay, good. But um, so Alan, what do you know about the band Blind Melon? Very little other than I know their music, but I couldn't tell you much about it. I know the lead singer uh, tragically died. I think yes. after the release of their second album, I believe, or second mainstream Correct. album anyway. Correct. Uh, no, that's after their second album. Yeah, yeah. yeah so um, I kind of the same boat. Uh, I have both of their albums because they came out when I was in college. Everybody probably knows the one song of theirs, No Rain, <laughs> that was featured on their first album, The Dancing Bumblebee Girl. Um, you know, they had their second album. I liked one or two songs off it. And then, yeah. Galaxy the, the news- off their second album is a really good yes. song. Yeah. It is. Mm-hmm. Um, their lead singer, like you mentioned, unfortunately died um, while they were kind of touring for that second album. And, you know, kind of fell off my radar. Didn't really know you know, anything else about them. Well, um, one of my friends recently said, hey, there's a documentary you should check out. It's on YouTube and it's free. Oh. And it's called Letters from a Porcupine. And it was released in 2001. And a lot of what it is, is live footage of Blind Melon performing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, me saying, uh, yeah, I had both of their albums. I liked, basically, I was one of those people that I liked the hits off the albums and didn't really pay attention to any of the other songs on the album. Mm -hmm. Well, this live footage really made me realize Shannon Hoon, he's got a very distinctive vocal style. He was amazing live like he just gave all his energy he was a very energetic live performer and the band they are also really talented tight musicians that you know i never really realized when you see them live you're like these guys these guys are the real deal (laughs) and sadly they only had two albums yeah so the um like i said the the documentary is basically a majority of it is live footage from different performances that they did um Featuring as well their performance at Woodstock, which was crazy, which I kind of remember when they performed at Woodstock in 1994, people were talking about, yeah, it was kind of a, kind of a nutso performance. Yeah. Um, But anyways, if you're the least bit interested in Blind Melon, I would recommend going on YouTube and typing in letters from a porcupine and you can watch the documentary and it's free. It's 83 minutes, so it's not too long kind of haunting that one of the last some of the footage that they're showing was shot less than a month before he died Wow! and yeah. showing him performing and everything showing him performing a lot of new material off of the album soup yeah so if you do watch the documentary off my recommendation and you're interested in it the kind of news angle here is that it was funny i just watched it and then like a day or so later i saw a news item 
that Oscilloscope Laboratories, who is a production company that is actually was started by, was it Mike D from the Beastie Boys? I believe one of the Beastie Boys started, I think it was Mike D. Um, Anyways, his production company is putting out a documentary that's a film assembled from hours and hours and hours of camcorder footage shot by the lead singer, Shannon Hoon of Blind Melon. And it's going to be released from Oscilloscope Laboratories. And it tells kind of a intimate account of the band, their creative process behind making their music. And it also ends up kind of showing you the tragedy of addiction. Mm -hmm. Apparently the lead singer was a big like camcorder fan. Like he just was shooting all the time, would talk to the camera all the time. And they've assembled all this footage and it's going to be called all I can say. It's going to be a documentary put out by about Lime Melon. So if you see letters from a porcupine for free on YouTube and you like it, then you know you can look forward to this other film that's going to be coming out sometime within the next year. Did they did they talk in the documentary at all, Chris, about their North Carolina connections? Because I know they actually they, lived they, in Durham, Chapel Hill area for a while. They did. Um, they didn't. I'm hoping that comes a little bit more in the yeah. the all I can say document that they'll put out. They kind of made a passing reference to mm-hmm. them spending a lot of time together in Durham, kind of forming as a band. And by the time they got signed and moved out to LA they've been rehearsing and practicing so much that they were just insanely, you know, well put together. And that, that shows in like live footage and stuff. So they made kind of a passing reference to it, but yeah. Well, yeah, just kind of a little synergy there too. So over the holidays, I was out West visiting family in the Seattle, Portland area. And my son and I actually took a tour of London bridge studios, which is where they recorded their debut album, uh, oh wow! Okay. So there's actually a lot of photographs and other things in the studio from where Blind mm-hmm. Melon had been there recording their album. So yeah, it's pretty neat. Very cool. Good. Well, I definitely want to check that out. So you said free on YouTube. Yes. Great. Mm-hmm. Even better. Love that. <laughs> so let's go ahead and stay in the music documentary vein, Chris, if we can. Um, a film came out on Apple TV, one of their kind of premier film events that uh you know showcase that are for Apple TV subscribers. Although I think it's relatively easy to get a free subscription, at least for the first year or so with the purchase of basically any Apple product, I believe you also get Apple TV free for a year. So this film is interesting in that it's not your traditional band documentary. It is basically a stage performance of a live telling of the autobiography that the two remaining Beastie Boys member Mike Diamond and Adam Horowitz have put together. So we are showing on most of the time we're seeing them on the stage with a crowd of people at a, at a theater as they're telling their autobiographical story, uh, complemented by photos and video that was running on a large screen behind them. Um, because Spike Jones, the director, you have some interesting moments throughout the film, some interesting choices, some things they do that are a little more on the creative side. Um, and I think the information they share is very interesting about their story and their history. Um, they go through quite a bit of their, their entire span of career. And of course, talking about the loss of one of their, one of their members also, uh, later on in their career. So Chris, I was looking forward to this and I will say I am recommending this because I think it is an interesting documentary. I do feel like it was a little too safe. I felt like it was a little too scripted. I felt like it was a little too rehearsed where I was hoping for something a little bit more real, something a little bit more um, raw, I guess. And I didn't quite get that, but I did find enough in the film to still recommend it as an interesting documentary to watch. If you have any interest in the Beastie Boys as performers, uh, regardless if the only thing you know about them is the whole License to Ill album and Fight for Your Right to Party, I think it's fascinating. Probably the most fascinating part of the film for me was them talking about that phase of their life where they really, really were the most popular they've ever been and how it was really as kind of meant to be a joke. It was meant to be a kind of a spoof on the kind of people they hated but right. found themselves actually being, being, having an audience made up of those people that they were really trying to ridicule in the first place. That was really fascinating to me. My, my always, my issue with any kind of documentary that's based on an autobiography is that you don't really have the other people's, opinions to mix in you're really right. truly just hearing from the subject so there are some moments in the story where i kind of wanted to hear others thoughts on it 
I wanted to hear other people's take on how they were as a, as a band, as friends, as people in general. And, and I didn't get that. Um, but overall, I still found it to be a very entertaining film that I think is worth watching. Just knowing that I kind of felt like there was some missed opportunities and I still crave for a true Beastie Boys documentary that really goes full circle and lets us know everything, not just them, but the people around them in their orbit. I'll give you a perfect example. I did not realize that the BC boys originally started out with a female on drums. Right. That was interesting to me and sure. very, very fascinating. And I loved hearing more about that, knowing that they actually started more as a punk band and they were more into that than before they got into rap. And they talk about some of the full circle they had with that, the girl in their band where they let her go, but then they kind of, kind of came back around to working with her in some way later on in life. And it made it sound really great that they kind of reconciled, but I kind of wanted to hear from her. <laughs> I, mean, I kind of wanted to hear how <laughs> sure. she felt the whole situation went. And that's where a good example of where I just don't feel like we got the full spectrum uh, because it was a very scripted thanks on their autobiography uh, film. So overall, I still enjoyed it and I will recommend it but I do think there's some caveats to it. So Chris, you and I haven't had a chance to talk about this yet. What was your thoughts on the film? I, I liked it. Um, I didn't think it was perfect, but I, you know, I did like it. Uh, let me do a correction too. It was Adam Yalk who was the founder of Oscilloscope, not Mike Diamond. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, gotcha. But um, yeah, Adam, Adam Yalk, who was one of the BC board members, and he is the one that has passed away. So the other two were the ones on stage kind of, you know, narrating the documentary. Um, Seeing what they did, I thought it was interesting. Um, and you, you know, they had to use, it, you could tell it was an event that basically, I guess, in New York, they probably shot it over the series of like two weeks and they did this performance every night and people would pay and come and see it. And these guys would basically stand up there and kind of do a spoken word performance for, you know, an hour and a half or whatever. Um, they do kind of make fun of themselves, but it is obvious they're reading off a teleprompter. And so, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you don't get other perspectives and you get the feeling that it's also very scripted in a way that they're literally reading stuff that they probably said offhand when they made the biography or autobiography that you're talking about. But you still kind of get a sense of maybe it would have been better suited to that because you would have been able to get different perspectives. But it, it still worked. And I think it worked because of um, Spike Jones, because he's known for doing things that are kind of odd and throwing people off. and sometimes you hear talk back with them and like Spike supposedly in the booth talking about an animation that was supposed to come up that didn't come up. And they, so I think there is a, some elements of spontaneity sometimes that happens in the live performances. Um, it does work. Um, I think it could have been a little tighter, but maybe that's kind of true to the beastie boy aesthetic as kind of throwing stuff up there, a punk rock way of saying, here it is. And this is what you have. Um, so overall it worked. And I would say that too, even though some things felt too scripted towards the end, when they are talking about, you know, Adam and his influence on the band and the fact that he's passed away. Um, and here again, I'm going to mess up the names. Although I think it is Mike D who ends up having to speak for um, the other Adam in the band because he gets, he gets too emotional and just can't talk anymore. And you can tell like, of the two that are up there talking, Mike Diamond is usually the more kind of nervous person where the other one's a little bit more practiced maybe and kind of delivers. He sits down on the edge of the stage and kind of tells about their last performance at Bonnaroo. And you, know, you can tell he's usually the more polished speaker, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, but when he gets emotional, Mike D has to kind of come over and just kind of take, not, t I mean, you know, borrow the mic from him and kind of, yeah you know, finish out the little anecdote they were doing. And so that, that lent some authenticity to it that maybe polished over some of my other feelings about, you know, them reading off a teleprompter sure. sometimes. Yeah. So. yeah, no, overall, I, I, I do think it was good. Again, I just, I, I, I had a few misgivings with it. I even voiced some of those concerns when we saw the trailer. A couple you did. Ago, look, yeah. I'm just a little worried. It's going to be a too sanitized, too much, self-aggrandizing version of the story. And there was a little bit of that. There was some humility in the, in the film. I would have liked to leave it a little more, but I think there's a reason why more full feature documentaries with all perspectives tell a much more interesting story than ones that are solely written from the, the, the protagonist's own words. Um, so anyway, 
But I think uh, stories, I think it's worth seeing. I'll, I'll say sure. That. Yeah. I, I was left. I think it's a great recommendation. Something people can watch from home. Um, you don't really have to have much of a subscription. I joined the uh, Apple plus thing. It was a free subscription for a week and I canceled it right afterwards. <laughs> so, and I joined specifically to watch that documentary. I was the one thing I was left wanting was footage of when the Beastie Boys, specifically Adam Yawk, joined Aerosmith on stage and played Walk This Way and basically yeah. chased Joe Perry around the stage. <laughs> I, I wish, because he was trying to like annoy him and like yeah. guitar with him. I, I wish I could have seen that because I think that would be very entertaining. <laughs> so. Absolutely would have been. That's right. All right. Well, that's BC Boy Story, my recommendation. So we've got two music documentary recommendations for you this episode. Uh, one free on YouTube, the other one basically free on Apple TV if you're willing to to do the the, the seven-day trial and just remember to, to cancel it at the end of that if you're not planning on sticking around for anything. So Chris, I think we have filled the plate here with as far as our, uh, our latest quarantine episode of Foot Candle Films goes. Even despite a lack of a lot of new movie uh, movies coming out and despite uh, the lack of movie news coming out, we still got quite a bit to talk about. So again, uh, kind of a recap, positive on The Assistant, both of us very positive on this film, both of us very, very positive on e Extraordinary as a great fun movie to watch, uh, Spike Lee's Defy Bloods coming to Netflix, Star Wars is getting Taika Waititi as a director and writer of a standalone feature film. Well, a feature film. Don't know if it's standalone, but at least a feature film in the Star Wars universe. Nick Cage will be playing Joe Exotic in CBS TV. And then our recommendations we gave. All right, Chris, a lot of stuff for people to chew on, a lot of stuff for people maybe to have reactions to or questions or their own opinions they want to share. How do they go about getting a hold of us? You could send us an email to info at the mesh TV and tell us maybe a film that you caught up with during this time at home on your couch and you can let us uh, know about it. Maybe we'll review it on the show. You can also follow us on Twitter at foot candle film. And then Alan and I both keep accounts on letterboxd and that's L A T T E R B O X D. And you can track what uh, we're seeing on there. And sometimes we leave short reviews. Um, also, closing note, uh, Foot Candle Film Festival will be running September 23rd through the 27th. Uh, if you're a filmmaker and you're interested in submitting something, submissions will continue to be open until June 1st. So you still have a little bit more time if you'd like to submit something. All right. Well, that is our show for today. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening to Foot Candle Films. Again, if you like what you're hearing and you want to visit us on themesh.tv, that is where you can find all of the Mesh podcasts. You can subscribe to any one of those shows. Subscribing is free, and it just means that you will always be notified whenever there is a new uh, episode available to you. You'll get that downloaded automatically to your device of choice once you have subscribed. There's also a lot of other shows on the Mesh Network, too, we encourage you to listen to. But until next time, this has been Alan Jackson and Chris Fry with Foot Candle Films. Thanks, and we'll talk to you next episode. See you in the ticket, Alan. Watch films in the company of like-minded people in the dark. Watch films in the underground. We won't let anyone know where you are. The films that don't make it to Carmike at the mall. Or ones that were famous when Grandpa would watch films out of the reverence of the heritage of an art. Watch films through the courtesy of what can film society. Special thanks to Carpal Tuller for the show theme music. For more about Carpal Tuller, visit www.carpaltuller.com. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard.